Hi, today I'm going to talk about sunscreen. Now we all know that the sun is aging, but we wouldn't want to not have any sun at all. If we were all walking around head to toe in protective suits, then we would all be deficient in vitamin D and that wouldn't be good either. But we do want to protect our skin because along with smoking and alcohol, we all know now that it is a very aging thing to do for your skin. Um, there are so many studies available online which you can look at the research which proves that the sun is particularly aging to the skin. You can find research where they've taken two you know, twins, so people with similar genetic makeup and DNA where maybe one twin has grown up in a sunny climate and the other one hasn't and when you look you compare the images when they get older I mean it's it's remarkable likewise there's another study which I always think is really interesting of a man that drove a lorry for 40 years and um, he was only exposed to sunlight through the side window um, through the glass and sometimes obviously with the glass down and the images of him when he was in his 60s one side of his face looks 40 years older than the other side so you've got this real photo aging happening on one side um, so yes it's not rocket science we all know that it's the case so what's the solution well we need to use sunscreen and we need to be screening from both UVA and UVB rays so just to recap UVB if you think of B as burning are the shorter rays and they're the ones that you can see the effect from the radiation you see the redness on the skin so they're the burning rays the ones that that make you pink um, and then there's the UVA, which is a sneaky one because it's deeper. You don't see immediate results, but the rays go much deeper into the skin. And if you think of the base level of your skin a little bit like a mattress, so you've got elastin fibers and then collagen molecules, and these longer UVA rays are breaking those down. This happens over a long period of time, so you don't notice immediately. So if you're young and think, oh, I'm in the sun, it, it kind of catches up with you later. Um, so they sort of leave you like a bit like a saggy mattress as they break down and th this, these are what form the wrinkles. Likewise UVA will give you pigmentation, again that takes a while to come out, photo aging and also cancer and melanoma. So we need to be protecting from UVA and UVB, broad spectrum is best. Now I did make a video about sunscreens, uh, I think it was the, one of the first videos I made when I started my website, so it's almost six years ago. And um, I took it down because people asked me why I took it down. It was so outdated in terms of ingredients. At that time, um, lots of the ingredients that were being used were being used sort of globally. And I had lots of different creams that I liked. But in the past six years, there's been such a huge disparity between the USA and the rest of the world that that video was really outdated and um, so that hence I'm making a new one. So we're at a really strange point, in fact where there are only 16 FDA approved sunscreen ingredients of which only eight are currently used. The rest are too outdated and outmoded. Um, and of those eight, only two are UVA protectors. Whereas in the EU and the rest of the world, there are 27 approved ingredients. And a lot of these are really the latest up-to-date great sunscreen ingredients things like um, I'll talk about in a bit triazones and triazines I'm going to write all these down and put them on my blog as well um, so it, there's a real disparity going on um, which is kind of strange and I think it's very frustrating and certainly all of the USA dermatologists and people who work for brands say that they're feeling quite frustrated about it and there has been a lot of lobbying the government. Part of the problem is that the FDA considers sunscreen to be an over-the-counter drug, whereas in the EU, for example, it's considered skincare with benefits, so it's a cosmetic ingredient, um, which obviously is, makes a huge difference because if you think to get drugs past the FDA costs millions, you know, in investment, in data, in research. Um, and also there isn't the impetus to do it because if no one can use it in the USA, then there isn't really, it's a level playing field. So why should one company pay to get it through the FDA when then everyone can use it? So there's a strange position going on. And on, on a good note, Obama finally made a legislation last year with the Sunscreen Innovation Act, which happened at the end of 2014. 
people I've spoken to, like Nathan Rivas, actually at um, Paula's Choice, said he feels it didn't quite go far enough because there isn't the funding there. There needed to be something in about funding because without the funding, it's very hard to get drugs past the FDA. So there's a problem going on, but at least something's being done. And I think everyone feels more confident now that these newer, improved ingredients will get past the FDA and get into American sunscreens. It's frustrating. I mean, Jeff Murad, I spoke to, said it's kind of frustrating because these are ingredients that have been used safely in the rest of the world for several years now and with amazing results. So there is a certain level of frustration there. And I think, you know, that um, it's something that will take time. And Tinosol, which is the, the, the triazones I spoke about earlier, they have already tried to get through the FDA since the Innovation Act, but they were there wasn't enough data, so they're having to do it again. So fingers crossed it'll work this time. So on to some recommendations, and these are some of the sunscreens that I personally like and recommend. I'm gonna break it into two sections, chemicals and mineral sunscreens, although many would argue that all sunscreens are chemical in origin, but that's kind of another argument which I'm not gonna go into. Um, so starting with all of the chemical ones that I've chosen do contain triazines, which are broad spectrum, and triazones, which are UVA, simply because this is, I know they're not FDA approved, but this is what all of the dermatologists I've spoken to recommend as the best ingredients available today. They've been used successfully for several years now because they're stable, they are very good at blocking the UVA and UVB rays, and um, they are used now in the majority of sunscreens that I've looked at globally. So all of these products I'm about to show you contain these and they have different names triazines and triazones come they're, they're groups so i will list all of the names on my blog in case you're interested so i'm going to start with event and um this is the factor 20 spf 20 they do one for combination and normal skin and one for more of a dry skin both are aimed at sensitive skin the reason I've chosen this, and it's quite low as SPF 20, is because when I had a conversation with Dr. Nicholas Lowe, who's a very well-respected dermatologist in the UK here that also works in America, we got onto the conversation of what was the ideal factor to use. And I think everyone thinks now, I want to look young, so I want to use factor 50 every day. However, he told me that he's seeing a lot more sensitivity, dermatitis and rosacea. And it can be because the difference between a factor 20 or 30 and a factor 50 is actually a lot more of the chemicals. So if you are very sensitive, you may find that if you're continuously using factor 50 every day, it increases your sensitivity and it can result in these dermatitis and, 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 and rashes and things. The other thing is that if you apply a factor, say 30, that will give you around 95, 96% filtration of the sun's rays. Whereas if you use a 50, you'll maybe only get an extra 2%, maybe even 1%. So it's weighing up this extra 2% of coverage for all these extra chemicals. So. This is just an argument and something which also um, Nathan at um, Paula's Choice agreed with that there is this kind of if you are sensitive, maybe you don't need to use factor 50 every day, just apply a factor 20 or 30, but apply it really well and make sure you reapply it and that will give you a good coverage, but without increasing your sensitivity. So I'm just kind of giving you all the up to date information that I have. So the next one I'm going to recommend is Nivea. Um, these, like all the sunscreens from Boots and a lot of the high street um, sunscreens, which are a great value for money, all contain triazines and triazones. And the one I've chosen is the anti-aging SPF 30, really good for every day, particularly if you're wearing makeup anyway, which gives you a physical block. And this is combining those triazines and triazones with antioxidants, which is a really good way to do it because as the damage is happening and as those UVA rays are breaking down your mattress, um, you have got those antioxidants which are helping to kind of rebuild those elastin fibers at the source. So it kind of makes sense to have a combination of 
protection with repair at the same time. So that's a really good one that's over the counter. So while we're talking about antioxidants, I'm gonna mention HelioCare. And this is a really good sunblock, which I was introduced to recently. This is their XF Gel SPF 50. It's not really a gel, it's a cream, but it's very light. Um, and I like lighter cream, so it's quite good if you're more combination. And it combines the triazines and all of those good um, blocks with a new patented, antioxidant which comes from fern plants they call it fern block but it's got that really good combination of a high level of antioxidants with a good sunblock so i really like that one they that i must mention as well that comes in a tinted version as well so um if the color suits you there's only one color available it's quite good if you're red because it takes down the redness it's like a yellowy tint Another good one from Japan, is, um, which contains triazines, is um, Kosei, and this is a good Japanese brand. This again is called Essence Gel, SPF 50. It is a broad spectrum. It is not a gel exactly, but it's a light and quite matte finish lotion. So again, nice if you're combination or if you just don't like those sort of heavy creams. While we're talking about oily skin, um, La Roche-Posay, which is obviously an amazing brand for sun creams and really some of my favorite sun creams over the years have been La Roche-Posay. This is the Anthelius SXL 50 and this is the matte finish, this is the anti-shine version so really great if you're um, oily. They also do it in a 30 as well for kind of every day and um, that gives you that kind of matte finish so you, you don't feel like you kind of you know got cream dripping off your face. This also comes in a much heavier version for dry, sensitive skin. So um, that's called the Comfort version. It's the same Anthelius XL Comfort. So at this point, I just want to make it really clear that I do realize that all of the sunscreens I've mentioned so far are not available in the USA simply because of the FDA restrictions. However, that does not mean that the sunscreens that you can buy in the US are not effective they have a long proven track record in being effective at blocking the sun's rays, broad spectrum and preventing cancer. So please don't panic. It's just that they're not the most up to date ingredients. And this is where the disparity is happening and also where the frustration is happening amongst the dermatologists and the dermatologists society and the government so but they still work so don't panic so on to a couple of American sunblocks that I um, would like to recommend the first one is by La Roche-Posay and this is Anthelius SX they have different ingredients obviously than the rest of the world but this particular product has a um, something called Mexeril SX which is a patented sunblock it's owned by L'Oreal uh, which has been used in Europe since 1991 and it finally got past the FDA in 2006 but it was only approved for this one product. It's only SPF 15 so it's more of a kind of everyday block, maybe not in the height of summer but something that you would use underneath your makeup. But um, Mexeril is a really good um, sunblock so it's a really good product. Um, another one that I really like is Paula's Choice. Um, I've chosen the skin balancing one simply because I'm more of a combination skin person so I like this matte finish but they make um, sunscreens for different skin types and this is a really good one which contains avobenzone and all of the other approved chemicals combined with antioxidants so really helping you with the anti-aging and um, containing all of the best of the approved FDA sunscreens. And um, I think this brand in general really take care and um, do very good products. Another one is Aven. Now again, different from the Aven in, that we have in the rest of the world, but again, this has um, avobenzone and all of the approved agreed ingredients. And this one is good for sensitive skin. It's also quite light. so. Even if you've got dry skin, but you don't want a heavy cream, this is a really nice light moisturizer. So finally, on to mineral sunscreens. Now these are the sunscreens I recommend that really focus just on the mineral ingredients. So by that, I mean zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. 
How these differ from the chemical sunscreens I've already spoken about, although actually a lot of those chemical sunscreens also have elements of minerals in them as well, um, is that the chemical ones mainly work by absorbing the sun's rays and these minerals work by reflecting the sun's rays, which is why when you use um, this type of sunscreen, if you have your photograph taken with flash, you'll often have a really white face. That is the zinc oxide and the titanium dioxide flashing that back. So that's why you get that real kind of ghostly look. So the first one I'm going to recommend is Institute Estoderme, and this is no sun. Um, I've used this for years and years and years, and it seriously blocks the sun with minerals, just with zinc and um, titanium. It does look a bit white on the skin. Um, I've used that on models, literally we've been out in the desert and you've put it on their faces or you've given it to people you're working with and at the end of the day, no one has any redness or any kind of suntan at all. So it really is for those hypersensitive, kind of fair skin, maybe freckly, people that just don't tan and maybe burn a lot. And um, yeah, and I've used it for years and I still really like it. It's quite greasy-ish. Um, so you do get kind of a slightly white glow to your face, um, but it is effective and that's what's most important. Another really good mineral block is the SkinCeutical Sheer Mineral UV Defense. This doesn't leave a white cast on the skin, um, simply because it's micronized technology, so the particles are much smaller, so the zinc and titanium. This is kind of a trend. There's also a nanotechnology trend whereby um, lots of sunblocks, mineral sunblocks you can buy now, use nanotechnology. So the particles are so small that you don't, you, they almost look quite sheer on the skin and you don't get that white sort of glaze to the skin. Um, nanotechnology gets a mixed response. Some people love it. Other people say that it can be dangerous because the particles are so small, they can get into the bloodstream. And um, there are again, lots of conflicting research really, and depending on who you talk to. One thing I will say is that a lot of the nanoparticles are suspended in silicones, the silicon coated zinc or um, titanium. So actually, although you're getting the no white glaze and you're getting that sort of nano look they're not big enough to get into the bloodstream so there is that kind of um, loophole which makes it okay i guess um but micronize is a bit bigger so it's it's it, it hasn't got the same controversy around it um and this is yes a really good one that combines all of those ingredients and um i find it to it looks really natural on the skin in terms overall of how to apply sunscreen, all of the ones I've, I've, I've mentioned, I think you really do need to look at the recommendations because each manufacturer will recommend how much you need to apply, how often you need to apply. Obviously, if you're lying on a beach, you need to apply regularly, you need to apply plenty, you know, be generous with it. Um, if it's in the winter maybe and you're just putting it on in the morning and then maybe putting makeup on, obviously you can get away with not reapplying as much. Um, but I think really be guided by your skin and by the manufacturer's recommendations. You know, always read them really carefully. As a kind of ballpoint, I'd say um, go for about two square centimetres of product for your face. So like a teaspoon is a good guideline. Make sure it's really well absorbed. So, you know, rub in properly. If you are um, working... Obviously, you don't want to be taking your makeup off in the middle of the day and reapplying sunscreen and putting a whole face of makeup back on. But if you're kind of just going in and out of an office, then a really good thing to try is a powder um, sunscreen. You can use these just to top up. So in the morning, you can apply your sunscreen properly. Then you put your makeup on and go to work. And then maybe at lunchtime, if you're going out for lunch or you're leaving work for whatever reason, something like the Peter Thomas Roth, and this is an instant mineral powder, these are all minerals, um, are really good. There's also a blue version of this, which has salicylic acid in, which is good for oily skin. So not only are you kind of getting that, you know, mattification, you're kind of really touching up your makeup, you're, all, you're also sort of 
touching up your SPF protection. Another good mineral sunblock, which is also very portable, is this one by Bare Minerals. So it's the same kind of great handy pack that you can keep in your handbag. This one's factor 30, and again, just really good if you've already got a full face of makeup on, you can just do touch-ups with it. Um, this, for some reason, is only available in the UK, this one, so I'm not sure why that is. Um, but another thing you can do is obviously just use mineral powder, which you, this is the Bare Minerals one, it's SPF 15. Lots of different brands do mineral powders, and likewise, you could just, you know, go all over your skin. It just tops you up really throughout the day and helps to keep you um, your makeup looking fresh. So it kind of has that really nice dual function. So that's kind of it. I mean, I've tried to cover a lot. Obviously, I haven't gone into great detail about everything. If you want to know more, there's lots of information on the internet. You can find out about different ingredients and FDA ruling and all of that stuff if you're interested. But I think in general, I think the, the bottom line is, you know, the sun is aging. It can be dangerous and it's an accumulative thing. So a little bit every day will add up. And you mightn't care about it when you're in your 20s, but when you get to 40 and you really start to see that sun damage coming through, then you might regret it. So it's as simple as applying a teaspoon of sunblock a day, whatever you use, a 15 or a 50 or a 30 or a 20, whatever, depending on where you live, applying that and just touching up and just being aware. It's really about being aware. So I'd love to hear from you about your favorite sunblocks, um, what you think about them. Um, um, I'm always interested in learning about new ones and new ingredients. So please let me know in the comments and I hope that was helpful and I'll see you soon.